Hello and welcome to Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. In this new series, we're traveling across the stunning Scandinavian countries of Norway, Sweden and Denmark in Northern Europe, bringing you the beauty of the countries and the Catholic faith there. Coming up in this episode, we visit a family in the beautiful Swedish countryside who built a chapel on their farm. We have to do it ourselves and I like building so I took a house, a side house there just at the main house and converted it. In the city of Trondheim in Norway we meet a Catholic priest with a fascinating story. As almost all Norwegian born Catholics I'm a convert. I have been a pastor on the other side of the street here in our former cathedral, the Nidarus Cathedral. And in Copenhagen, we meet the Bishop of all of Denmark. The truth should be um, proclaimed without reservation. This is Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. We wanted to become farmers. That was our keen interest when we met. We always dreamed about a farm. Working on the farm has been the best time in my life. I've never done anything that's good for both body and the soul. 250 miles southwest of Stockholm, in the picturesque Swedish countryside, we visit Korrad Farm, and this is the place the Cavallan family calls home. It's a big a blessing living out here on the, at the countryside and the beautiful garden that my mother has created. And each evening, after a long hard day on the farm, the family gather for dinner, young and old, with plenty of laughs. The next morning, it's up bright and early, with another busy day on the farm ahead. But not before they pray, out in the open, and also in the small chapel they have built on their land. They're a family of strong faith, and it all stems from the parents, Sam and Stella. They're both from Sweden, and growing up, none of Stella's friends were Catholic, so she joined a Catholic youth group. It was on one night that a friend convinced her to attend a Catholic dance, and that's where she met Sam. And his mother had three sons who participated in that youngster group, so I was there on New Year's Eve. And then I met him because he was at that a military in the northern part of Sweden, and he was engaged to a girl. And I just had this kind of firm notion, I'm going to marry that guy. A few months later, after much persuading, the pair eventually met again. So he got a little bit interested in me. The couple began to fall in love and wanted to marry. Sam was Lutheran and Stella was Catholic, so he converted but not before asking a lot of questions about the faith. What is this? What is this happening to me? And, and then the, the joy of everything is falling into its place. On an ice cold day in January, the couple wed in front of 50 of their closest friends and family. And Sweden being a predominantly Lutheran country, it's very unusual to have mass as part of the wedding ceremony. So we had a long mass, a <laughs> big yeah, ceremony. Yes. <laughs> After a year, Stella was pregnant with their first child and a large family would follow. We, we were blessed with nine children and all of them, everyone, without exception, and it was very welcomed because I had no um, wish to restrict my family. My mother uh, had a speech to us at our engagement day and she foretold the future for us in a way. She said, 
that you will never be rich, but you will never have a boring instant. Along the way, they decided to pursue their lifelong dream of having a farm. They moved to the remote island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea, where they lived and worked on a farm for many years. Their priorities changed in the early 80s, and they decided to move back to the mainland, to this farm, where they would continue to raise their growing family. Going on walks and uh, uh, going down to the lake and uh, sailing. And as devout Catholics committed to bringing up their children in the faith, they faced unique challenges here, as the nearest church is over 45 minutes away by car. That's when they decided to build their very own chapel. So we have to do it ourselves, and I like building. So I took a brewer a house, a side house there, just at the main house, and converted it to a, to a chapel. By building a church themselves, and Sam being an ordained deacon, they could schedule their days around prayer and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament right at their doorstep. They meet to pray in the chapel at 7 a.m. with their daughters Teresa and Magdalena, who work the cattle farm throughout the day. At 5 p.m., Sam distributes Holy Communion. Stella always wanted a vocation in the family, and when her daughter Marta turned 16, as part of her schoolwork she had to interview a nun. She asked her various questions about the faith, and when Stella read them, she was surprised. So I read through her work, and every question she asked the nun, and the answer knew, I knew were her own. She is going to become a nun, and that was the first time I realized that she had the vocation. Although initially pleased with Marta's choice, she was later struck by a great unexpected sadness, seeing her daughter leave for the convent. I cried, I think I cried for three days, and uh, I thought it was um, because I knew, no, I knew I was going to lose her in, in a way. But how, how, can, how can you want something and can't cope with it? It's crazy. In Sweden, the idea of a young girl wanting to become a nun is so far from the norm that the press heard of her vocation and all the newspapers were on their doorstep in the lead up to her joining the convent. Becoming a nun, it's, 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 it's unbelievable in Sweden. They, they can't understand it, but they are very, very taken in the people. At age 19, Marta joined the Carmelites, a strict cloistered order. Living under a vow of silence, she is never allowed to leave the convent and can only see her family at special times during the year. The convent works hard to keep the families involved as much as they can and make it easier for them. When Sam got some bad news about his health, Marta did everything she could from inside the convent to help her father. And I got cancer and a heart disease, uh, uh, I think, uh, four or five years ago. And she was... Asking everyone. everyone. <laughs> she, she That's ever why Cardinal Burke to, came to, she to, to pray. She transported oh. the, uh, whole, half of the church to, to pray for me. And now I'm out of the cancer. I don't know why I competed the statistics. Sam's recovery has been an answer to everyone's prayers. Nothing would be the same without him here. Having a big family, being a part of it, is a big blessing. It's been a big blessing. I love my family very much. Without them, I don't think I would have that faith I have today. This is Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. From Sweden, we head to Norway now and the city of Trondheim. Trondheim is a historic port in central Norway and the third largest city in the country. It's a beautiful scenic city which, because of its location, has been a hub throughout history. Mm -hmm. 
And in the city is St. Olaf's Cathedral, which was constructed in 2016, making it one of the newest cathedrals of the Roman Catholic Church. Father Egil Mogstad is the pastor, and he was involved in choosing the winning architect for the design. So in a way, I am obliged to, to like it all, but uh, I'm especially proud of our apsis, this hemicircle in the sanctuary, because to make modernist architects make something that's not straight and square, that's some kind of a job. And this new cathedral is now home to a diverse group of faithful. I'm the only Norwegian. My chaplains are Kenyan, Filipino and Polish. And in a way, this covers quite well our parish. We say, symbolically, we have around 120 nationalities here. As almost all Norwegian-born Catholics, I'm a convert. I have been a pastor on the other side of the street here, in our former cathedral, the Nidarus Cathedral, but just for two years, uh, because uh, all my Christian education I had from the Dominicans in France, so it was just that I felt, well, the Church of Norway is the Church in Norway, which I later on found is not right. I think, you know, I'm quoting Basil Hume, the former Archbishop of Westminster there, and it's the same here. We are the church in Norway, not the church of Norway. We're not ethnically Norwegian. We are a church for everybody. Trondheim is home to the biggest and most international university in all of Norway, which means it sees people coming from all over the world. And for instance, on Sundays then, you can see we had a Mass in Latin at 9, now there's the High Mass at 11 in Norwegian. At 1 o'clock it's the Mass in Polish, and ordinarily at 3 o'clock, not this Sunday, but ordinarily this is some of the other languages with priests coming in. And then at 6 p.m. we have a Mass in English, and that's the normal Sunday for us. Norway once had the smallest Catholic community in Scandinavia, but has grown over the years and is now the biggest. Denmark, they are 50,000. In Sweden, 100,000, and we are 150,000. Over the past eight years, the number of Catholics in Norway has tripled, which is mainly attributed to an increase in people immigrating from Poland and Lithuania. And it's still growing. My parish grows with between 10 and 15% per year. Just across the street from St. Olaf Cathedral, is the Lutheran Cathedral. It's called the Nidarus Cathedral because this is the old name of the city of Trondheim, means the city at the mouth of the river Nid. It's one of the oldest cities of Scandinavia. And this was then the metropolitan see of the province, the Roman Catholic Church province, the northernmost in medieval Europe, covering mainland Norway and all the isles in the Atlantic Northern Atlantic Ocean, towards Iceland, Greenland, and down to the Isle of Man. So this was a very important place with the Archbishop, who had then 12 suffragan bishops all over this ocean area. But it was also the most important pilgrimage goal of the northern countries with the chest of Saint Olaf the eternal king of Norway, as we say. In 1537, when the Reformation was imposed on Norway from Denmark, the former Catholic cathedral was forced to become Lutheran and remains so to this day. But in the Middle Ages and through the Middle Ages, this was the real spiritual center of Norway and all the Scandinavian countries. Jerusalem of the North, as it was also called. It wasn't just the Catholics who were forced to convert to Lutheranism. People were discouraged from practicing any other form of religion. We don't know so much about it, but um, very soon um, there were restrictions. And uh, if you were Norwegian, you were obliged also to be Lutheran. And we have examples of young men from this city who went down to the southern side of the Baltics in the 16th century to study at the, the Jesuits' very good schools down there. But they were also taken by the theology and converted, and some of them became priests. And when they came home and were discovered, they were expelled. So it was very strictly 
Lutheran all up to 18, the 1840s. It was in 1843 that there was a restoration of the Catholic Church in Norway, which can be attributed to the French Revolution, when approximately 30,000 priests were forced to leave France. Many came here, and in 1872 the Catholic Church opened back up in Trondheim. Here in Trondheim we will now in uh, some years, in 22, celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Catholic Restoration, as we say. The devastating Notre Dame fire of 2019 in Paris stood out to Father Egil particularly because it happened on the Monday of Holy Week, and the very same thing happened here on the Monday of Holy Week in 1531, which gutted the cathedral. It all burnt down the forest, as they call it, these immense uh, wooden constructions beyond the vaults. Here they fell down. And just six years later came the Re Reformation, so here nothing was restored. Behind me is a silver crucifix, and just there they built in a thick wall and used only the eastern parts further on. But this then is in many ways a modern part of the building. Here the walls are original and medieval, just up to the vaults of the aisles. So all this top part here was built through the 20th century. So I. I feel it's uh, some kind of a modern adventure. And for Father Egil, he gets a great thrill out of spending time in this church and admiring its sheer beauty. I think it must be what we really call the heart of Norway, the core Norvegia, and that's the high sanctuary. First because of the architecture, which is really uh, amazing, and uh, it's all original not so much touched by modern restorations. And then, of course, the religious side. It's built exactly there because where the main altar is now was the first tomb of St. Olav here along the river Nid through the city. And uh, there was also his silver chest behind the altar all through the Catholic period. In remembrance of a silver crucifix that was a medieval gift from the Orkney Islands, but it disappeared with the Danes. And then for the 900 years anniversary of the death of St. Olaf in 1930, when they reconsecrated this new part of the nave, then came a new silver crucifix from the West. And it's American then, uh, a collection organized by Sons of Norway, as it's called, that you'll find all over the US. Here at the Lutheran Cathedral, the Catholic faith comes to life once a year on the 29th of July, when they're allowed to host a Catholic Mass with the Bishop, and it's always a full house. Of our Lutheran friends do also appreciate, and they say <laughs> from time to time, by fact we should exchange cathedrals, also because we have more people coming to church than they have, but as our Bishop says, it's good to be here once a year, but it's also good not to have to think of the maintenance of this immense building. <laughs>
when the European Union was enlarged in 2004, it opened the borders to more immigrants to live and work in Denmark. However, in recent years, like in many European countries, immigration in Denmark has become a thorny issue and it has introduced some of the toughest anti-immigration laws in Europe. For us as a Catholic Church, it has been a very great enrichment because uh, we were very few Catholics and uh, the community has relied very much on uh, immigrant Catholics who have uh, strengthened the Catholic presence in Denmark. Immigration is something Bishop Kazan knows very well because of his own family background. Only my father came from Poland during World War II as a refugee. My mother was born in Denmark, but by Polish parents who came to Denmark before World War I to look for work. Because of his own family's history and the fact that immigrants make up such a big part of the Catholic Church in all the Nordic countries, he doesn't want to see them left outside. His motto as bishop is truth in charity. I choose that motto uh, because I thought it was very appropriate that truth should be um, proclaimed without reservation, without hesitation, even if it's sometimes uh, uh, inconvenient, politically incorrect, then uh, we have to stick to to the truth of uh, Christianity. Well, if you f uh, feel a calling to, uh, to be a priest or religious person, then uh, you, of course, uh, have to pray a lot and to go to, to confession. I think our main mission is to have the fundamental confidence that the church is a church of God and that God will never abandon it. That's it for this episode of Catholic Scandinavia. But coming up in the next episode, we learn about St. Olav, the patron saint of Norway, and hear about the beautiful St. Olav's Way that so many pilgrims walk each year. There are days with sunshine, there are days with rain, there are steep hills, there are beautiful scenery. If you just get focused on the way too much, you might miss it. But if you look up, you see the beauty. Uh, if you only look up, you might stumble. There's so many wonderful images. In Sweden, we visit the cathedral in Stockholm, which has a hidden shrine. It's full of relics from Hieronymus, from Teresa of Avila, and actually from saints that are more or less forgotten now. And in Denmark, we hear one woman's inspirational conversion story. You learn to love him because you come to know him. You cannot love someone you don't know. See you next time on Catholic Scandinavia.